Can you hear me? This is good. Okay, so, talk number two. And when it comes to tutorials and accessibility design, there is no better person that knows about this stuff than Hannah Bruce. Buns. Bruce. Buns. Buns. <laughs> yeah, Oh, that's because we misspelled it. I'm so sorry. Hi. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit further, um, my name's Hannah, and um, I'm currently employed as a QA tasker, but my um, background, both university and other professional stuff, is uh, mixing the world of cognitive psychology with games development. Um, for my undergraduate dissertation, I conducted a study combining video game tutorials and cognitive psychology. The aim of this study basically was to determine whether or not um, current game tutorials were effectively and were effective and more importantly enjoyable. Um, so games, whether they be digital, um, so video, phone, tabletop, board, card, or social games, are all form of all forms of active entertainment. What I mean by that is that um, games require someone to sit down and actively play them. Like you can sit down and watch a film or read a book, but you'd never really fully interact with this form of entertainment. Now unfortunately, due to this nature of the active nature of games, there is a barrier of entry. With a book, for example, if you don't know the meaning of a word, you can just go look up in a dictionary or garner its meaning from the surrounding sentence. Not knowing this particular word doesn't physically stop you from completing the book. However, in games, if you don't know how to play, whether that's in regards to the control schemes, the mechanics, or anything else. This can seriously hamper not only your progression of the game, but also your enjoyment. This is where tutorials come in. And I'm going to start off with a brief history of tutorials in video games. Way back in the beginning, um, we had arcade machines, and games on these machines were designed to be as short to play as possible, which is by no means a criticism of their design. It's just how things work. Um, and due to the coin-operated design of these games, gameplay information such as a brief description of the game's controls may have been physically printed on the front of the machine or the buttons would have been labelled with what each purpose button had. But then with the introduction of home consoles, there was no longer the option of physically printing the gameplay instructions on, onto the consoles as with arcade machines. Like, can you imagine having a NES with the gameplay instructions for every NES game ever printed on front, it would be a mess. And due to the limitations and hardware, uh, due to the limitations of the hardware and software at the time, gameplay information could not be included in the game. So manuals or instruction booklets, as Nintendo called them, were the solution. Manuals even doubled up as a way to keep kids quiet during the journey home from the stores, which I can definitely attest to being one of those kids. Um, and they also smelled so good. Yes. <laughs> but if there's any button perfume makers in the room, bottle that scent and I will throw money at you. <laughs> Manuals also often included the game story and character descriptions and controller layouts as shown here, simply because the disc sizes were too small to include anything other than the core game. Now start screens are a staple image of video games. All generations of games have had start screens in some form or another. And for most players, this screen is the first impression of the game's interactivity. So what happens when a game starts off by actively lying to the player? Which sounds like a really harsh, aggressive uh, sentence to say, but it's true. With Far Cry 3, as shown here, um, it quite clearly states, press start. So anybody um, would just assume that means press the button, on PS3 at least. But that's not the case. The only button that progresses into the game is X. Which, it's just, it's just wrong. Um, however, in Mass Effect 2, for example, it says press start button. And this button works as expected. Every time I buy a new game, the first thing I do is I'll ignore what this says and try every other button just to see if the developers are lying to me. 
And in the rare occasion where that text matches the actual implementation, I will go on about it for days, <laughs> just to try and get this point across. And when I showed this um, presentation slide to a friend, he remarked, showing a picture of a Vita with the title, The Future, just seems like a cruel, cruel joke. He's not wrong. <laughs> However, we do currently have the technology in our hands, quite literally in our hands, that could shape the future. I should have bought my Vita, that would have been more literal, actually. Um, that could shape the future of tutorials. Because with devices like um, the PS Vita, the Wii U gamepad, smartphones, tablets, any device that can connect to um, digital things, hell, I think even toasters on the Wi-Fi these days, um, could help make manuals come back via digital means and even extend into fully um, developer verified walkthroughs. So no more hunting down on IGN or game FAQs or random places on the internet when you're stuck on a level. So for example, um, if say you're stuck on, I don't know, level eight of a game, you could load up a companion app on your router, phone, whichever device you have, and it could automatically sync up with the game and show you exactly what information you need for that level. That's a free idea out there. If anybody wants to implement that? It's a free idea. Um, digital PC games already have this functionality in a very basic format um, by providing links to digital manuals. However, I personally, the process of finding the manual link, minimizing the game, going to that link, finding the information you need in the manual, and then going back to the game, breaks immersion, and by the time I've gone back into the game, I've already forgotten what I've just read. Now, um, throughout the course of my study and the research that I conducted, um, I determined that there were seven different types of tutorials that have, have been used and are currently in use in games today. I like to um, liken them to the seven deadly sins, except they're not sins and they're not deadly. It's just there's seven of them. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm full of bad jokes by the way, it's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> My absolute favourite, um, both in terms of implementation and actually playing, is a um, narrative tutorial. And these rely heavily on the game's plot. Um, with uh, Fallout 3, for example, where the game starts just as you're being born. So literally, right from the moment you can do anything, it's teaching you how well, to be a human. <laughs> um, so some people might actually need to just go back and play that tutorial again. <laughs> like when you're a toddler, it teaches you um, the movements of the game, which is at the age of you know, a toddler that would be learning the movements. Um, and I think it's around right about age 10 when you learn about the game's morality systems, which is as when most 10 year olds also learn about morality systems in real life. Same with when you reach high school age in the game, you go through the GOAT exams, I believe. Not actual GOATs, by the way, if that's just the in game acronym, which I can't remember right now. But it, it does rely on the game's plot and it teaches you in a very hidden way. Because um, with narrative tutorials, if they're executed correctly, the player won't notice um, that it is a tutorial. It's kind of the whole thing of like, if you're doing it right, no one will notice. If you're doing it wrong, everybody will notice. And then because of course this is me, I also have to put Assassin's Creed in everything I do. Um, this also has a um, narrative tutorial in that the game's plot calls for the main character to be taught how to use the animus and it just provides the perfect mask for the tutorial. But, however, whilst these feel natural in both a logical and yeah, in, a, in a logical sense, um, players may miss crucial information. So, if, say, like you're watching a film that's really plot heavy and you just look away for two seconds, next thing you know you look back at the screen and the good guys are now the bad guys, the world is being flipped upside down and now there's aliens, and you can't remember exactly how that happened. At least with films and books, you can go back 
and either rewatch or reread what has happened. Whereas games don't really have a rewind button. Again, there's another free idea. Don't rewind buttons in your games. The second type of tutorial that I um, identified is um, visual type, which are kind of similar to narrative in that the um, player may not even be aware that this, type of, that this is an actual tutorial. With Portal, for example, at the beginning of each test chamber, there's a step-by-step -step guide um, through these images um, that shows the player what you have to do to go through that test chamber. And I think I've spoken to about 10 people about this so far, and roughly seven to eight of them have gone, oh, oh yeah. And then th that evening I've seen them pop up on Steam saying so and so is now playing Portal. Okay, I know exactly where, what you guys are doing with that then. Um, these visual tutorials may also be delivered in the form of companion characters such as um, Sparks in Spire of the Dragon, who is increasingly difficult to find a screenshot of. Um, and these are quite highly accessible tutorials, which I'll go on about in a little bit, um, in that they require little to no text. So that keeps your localization costs down as well. Um, but again, with as with the narrative tutorials, they are easy to miss. So you know, um, the vast majority of people I spoke to about the portal tutorial hadn't even noticed they were a thing. Um, and then going back to my favourite thing, manuals, um, which as I said, they are almost a long forgotten tutorial form. However, as recently as two thousand and six which dawned on me this morning was nine years ago, so not really that recent. Um, Pokemon Black shipped with a manual that was over 60 pages in length, and that was just in the English language, making it one of the longest manuals ever produced. <coughs> it's unfortunate that Nintendo are the only company still doing these, and even they've started to decrease. But they, I would argue that manuals in themselves are an art form. Um, but they also are highly expensive to make. So you hire copywriters who, who have to know the game inside and out, as well as graphic designers, and that is just mostly expensive for smaller companies. But they are an easy reference guide, because you can just pick up the manual, just flick through it, you instantly know what you need, and just toss it to the side and carry on playing. And a downside to most people with manuals is they are he they emphasise heavily on text, which can then increase localization prices and it, it can get to a mess. But just someone just bring back manuals, please. <laughs> I don't even care if your game is the worst game in the world. I will buy it just for the manual and then praise about it on Twitter for roughly a year, probably, knowing me. I've um, used the, what number we have here? Fourth, yeah. Um, fourth type that I um, identified is what I've just called exploration. Which I've used, uh, used that word as a cleaner way of saying um, no tutorials, no help, you're on your own. Um, games such as Dark Souls sell, sell themselves on this type of gameplay. Um, like this boss that I took a screenshot of the Asylum Demon, you come across him 10 minutes into the game and you're just thrown at him and it's like, hey, this is what the rest of the game was like. Go on, we dare you to try it. I've never actually played Dark Souls myself because I don't like difficult games. So um, I can't really talk too much about that, but um, people who I know love this type of game also really enjoyed this um, type of tutorial mainly because you've also got the freedom of exploration, which is really respectful to the players. It's, it's not assuming that they're idiots. It's just like, hey, here's this game. Look at this wonderful world we created. Just go learn about its secrets. Just, just have fun with it. Um, to bring this back to the research that I did, um, this was the most enjoyable type of tutorial, but also the least effective. 
but if you're not, if you don't rely too much on analytics and people getting things just right, then this is the way forward. Um, unless, of course, you want people to hit particular story beats during the game at particular moments, because players will learn at their own pace and they will go through them, through all this, at their own pace, and you, they may not hit the same story beats that you want them to at the same time. But it's still the best one there is, in my semi-professional opinion at least. To the complete opposite end of the scale, um, we've got um, pop-up prompts, which if any of you play mobile games, um, particularly free-to-play mobile games, you, you probably die inside every time you see one of these. I know I do. Um, and I've used the, word, the term pop up here as a way of saying forced, because you can't get to the game unless you go through this exactly how the designers want you to go through. Um, as a tutorials of this type are very common in the mobile market, where players have to complete a set of actions before being introduced into the game proper. Tutorials, or first time user experiences <laughs> like this, will interrupt gameplay, such as. Um, I believe it's Sega's recent um, release of Crazy, Task, uh, Crazy Taxi City Rush, where you'll get a pop-up just as you're about to go around the corner. And it's like, well, that's all of my momentum just gone. Um, data from my study showed that whilst this type is the most effective, literally just because players physically cannot continue until the correct key is pressed, um, it is the least enjoyable and most frustrating type. Um, however, um, <coughs> um, Ubisoft's Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon release took this tutorial type and turned it completely on its head. Fagging and some stickers know, they know exactly what I'm on about here. Um, just by making sarcastic comments when the player followed each instruction. I think, um, I only played this on the first day it came out, which seems like 5,000 years ago at this point. Um, once you press jump, you just get a sarcastic voice over and say, well done, you jumped. Congratulations. Like, just completely deadpan, and it's fantastic. Um, but if you are making a mobile game, this is probably, unfortunately, the way to go simply because it creates a funnel and it helps you as a designer and developer teach players about different mechanics exactly when you want them to be taught about. Except I've noticed quite a few mobile games uh, will um, show you all of the mechanics straight, to, straight through the fatigue, so like the first couple of seconds of the game, and then you can't actually use some of those mechanics until like 75 of 75% of the way through the game, at which point you've kind of forgotten everything. And as I mentioned before, games don't have rewind buttons. So there's that, at least. Um, I'm loath to talk bad about games I have previously worked on, but there was one in particular at a studio I worked at last year um, that had 108 actions between loading the game and being able to play the game. That is roughly 108 too many, in my opinion, and no matter how much data I threw at them, they were just like, oh well, we don't really care. Um, so happy to say I no longer work for that company, for many other reasons as well. Um, and what are we up to now? Six, I believe. Um, it's kind of a bit of a non-tutorial in that it's just a player decision. Obviously, depending on how the player decides, you can then do whatever you want, essentially. Um, because more and more games these days are embracing the concept of giving the player the choice of experience in tutorials, which is great because it's highly respectful to the player. It's letting them choose exactly what they want to do. And it makes the player feel in control, even though that's a complete false sense of control. But 
I don't need to know that. Um, where am I now? Um, much like with the portal example, um, I've spoken to a number of people about um, Minecraft's tutorial. And yet again, I've been um, faced with the same thing of, oh, oh yeah, never noticed that before. In the, the achievements list is the tutorial, and it's completely optional. You never have to look at the achievements list. But once you do, you can see how once you've achieved an achievement, it's a really complicated sentence, um, you can hover over the next word and it branches off and you can just choose as to what you want to do, but it tells you how to do it. But it's there without anybody noticing that it's there and you don't have to do it. Um, last time I did this talk, I hadn't actually played Minecraft, so I didn't, um, well I had played it, but I hadn't played it for like two years. So I wasn't sure if this information was up to date, but I can say after semi-working on a Minecraft mod um, recently, yes, this information is still up to date. Um, one slight downside to this is that um, egotistical players may miss information in that they might think, oh, you know, I've been playing games since I was like two weeks old. I don't need no tutorials. And then they get to a point and they're just like, oh, I don't know what to do and they can't go back, um, which is my advice in that particular scenario would be to um, make tutorials optional at any point. That probably requires a lot more um, logic and programming and difficult stuff than anybody really wants to admit to. But if your players are happy, I kind of think all that hard work is worth it. And finally, um, we've got natural progression tutorials, which is just, it's essentially where the level designer is teaching the game, uh, teaching the game, it's uh, teaching the player how to play the game. Um, as with the visual and narrative tutorials, if it's done correctly, uh, the player won't even notice that they're being taught. And it shows information in a simple, logical manner. Um, it rewards the player simply through the core game loop and it is, it's highly logical from both a um, design perspective and a player perspective. Um, one slight downside to this is that um, as a designer you would have to notice, uh, you'd have to um, be on board with the tutorial from the moment you start designing your levels, which is kind of when you should be looking at your tutorials. Um, natural progression and narrative tutorials may actually even sometimes be the same thing, such as in Tomb Raider, um, the most recent one, where Lara is learning new things about survival throughout the course of the game's plot. So, it's all well and good knowing what tutorials are out there, but humans learn in uh, three main different ways. Um, and some people respond to um, some people respond better to one particular style of learning than others. Some respond to all three types in equal amounts, and then there are some people who just they're probably outliers in the data and don't really respond to all three. Um, there, said, there are three main learning types, but they can be broken down into multiple subsets. But I don't think anybody here is anybody is here for a full-on cognitive psychology um, lecture, I hope. Um, so the first one, and this is making a really weird noise, um, is auditory, um, which is essentially learning through listening. Um, an example of this would be this talk. Hopefully, hopefully you're learning as I'm speaking, I really hope. Um, and as you can see, the narrative um, natural progression and pop-up prompts type of, types of tutorials fit into this. Um, then the best, the type that is more suited to games at least, is how people learn through visual means. Um, which is basically learning through um, written words and pictures. Obviously if you've got subtitles in your game, which I'll also go on to a little bit later, 
then um, that kind of crosses into both visual and auditory. If you've got voiceovers to go with those subtitles. I, for example, when I um, upload these slides and the speaker notes, hopefully this will then turn into a visual learning technique. And finally, then you've got kinesthetic, which is basically learning through doing. So hopefully, next time you design a tutorial, that will be a kinesthetic type of learning. And from a design perspective, playtesting uh, would then definitely come under kinesthetic because you'd be learning as you're designing, getting real-time players in, seeing how they respond to things, and hopefully taking on board all of their feedback. To bring that background to tutorials, um, ideally, tutorials should aim to encompass as much of these three learning styles as possible. Now, it is pretty much impossible to please everybody in the entire world, but you can try. Um, but the more people who can understand and learn from your tutorial, the better, in theory at least. Which leads me on to accessibility. In that, um, again, theoretically, the more people who can play your game, the more people will play your game. Um, and pers uh, personally, accessibility is the key to a great game. You can have a bog standard 7 to 8 out of 10 game but adding in just some extra layers of accessibility can very easily bump that up to a 9, sometimes maybe 10 out of 10, although more and more places are dropping review scores. Um, and there are multiple ways for a game to be as accessible as possible, um, but the two easiest ways of accommodating players with disabilities or um, different types of issues um, is players with sight and hearing issues. Um, first up, subtitles. Many games, including uh, Rockstar's L.A. Noir, um, show the opening cutscene before presenting the player with any option to switch on subtitles. I require subtitles in my games. It's just, unfortunately, a hearing issue that I kind of have. And I still have no idea what is actually said during that opening cutscene of L.A. Noir. I've played this game roughly five times and I still have no idea. I've watched videos of it on YouTube and still I, I cannot tell what is being said. Um, simply because I cannot switch subtitles on for seeing it, nor can I toggle the sound effects, the volumes of the dialogue and the background music. However, um, in for my second son, Uh, launches right into the um, opening cutscene and the player can uh, switch on subtitles without there being a menu. You just press triangle and boom, subtitles, straight away. It's a seamless approach to this and I'm actually still yet to play for a second zone but I'm quite excited to simply because of this. And then the second easiest way of accommodating as many players as possible is um, through colorblind, um, using color techniques to help um, players who are colorblind. Because estimates show that around 10% of casual male gamers are red, green, colorblind. And this is a huge percentage of people who may not be able to play your games. Some, something as simple as adding contrasted text instead of relying on colour-coded HUD elements can make the world of difference to a large number of players. I know Trello isn't a game, um, but their colourblind techniques are absolutely fantastic. These are what it looks like without um, colourblind um, friendly mode switched on. And then once you switch it on, as you can see, you've got patterns helping to differentiate between the different colours. And same with um, Zuma 3 here, um, where you've got to match the different colours, but each different type of ball has different patterns on. And um, Unreal Engine 4 comes with a built-in colourblind simulator, which allows you as developers to see exactly what your players see. 
and I also believe there's various plugins available on the asset store for use with Unity. It has literally never been easier to accommodate colorblind players than it is now. But there are, of course, um, players with other forms of disabilities and difficulties, such as cognitive issues and motor control issues. Um, Sometimes accommodating these players can be as simple as allowing for custom control layouts or even providing an option to switch off or hide all non-interactive elements. Um, for more information on this, um, I highly recommend these three websites. Um, the top one, GameAccessibilityGuidelines.com, has actually provided me, I'm not affiliated with them, by the way, um, just a quick disclaimer, but has provided me with um, handouts for them so if you just want to come and talk to me afterwards, I can just give you um, just in the form of business cards um, with all of their information on. And this website I've referred so many people to, and as such, their games have been a bit better. But unfortunately, there are players with even more serious issues, which as developers, you, it is unrealistic for you as developers to um, predict and accommodate really but that is where companies like um, sorry charities like special effect and able gamers come in and if you ever want to donate to charity I highly urge you to um, donate to special effect simply because of the fantastic work they're doing for accessibility in games and that is the end Great, so uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions, if anyone wants to ask. Hiya. Um, so, why do you think in mobile games the general form of tutorials is funneling? Why, why is that so prevalent, specifically in mobile games? Um, excellent question, and probably something I should have gone over, actually. Um, I believe it was the um, CEO or founder of Instagram that said, you've got seven seconds in which people loading up mobile games have to decide as to, as to whether or not they're going to, con to continue playing this game. So you've got that initial couple of seconds where you have to show to your players that it is this is a fun game, it might be complex, it might be incredibly straightforward. You've just got that very quick seven seconds to uh, bring in and grab your players. Um, as for the funnel effect, um, most mobile gamers are extremely casual um, in that, you know, my mother, who is fast approaching 60, now has a tablet and is downloading mobile games. She's never played a game before in her life, it's like the Candy Crush Saga, but that's a different rant. Um, so you have to accommodate players who may not even think of themselves as players. They've just downloaded this game from the App Store that they've seen advertised on TV, or they've just opened the App Store to look for something else and it's been featured. You think, oh, okay, that looks kind of cool. So that's just, it's simply just because of the inexperience of the millions of other people playing. So just maximum handholding. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so, you would argue that the tutorial, the type of tutorial you use, not only needs to, to be compatible with the game you're doing, but also with the audience you're expecting, right? Because when you're doing a tutorial for a game like Half-Life or All Out, it's a very story-driven game, so you would expect a story-driven tutorial. Yeah. In Dark Souls, you, you just <laughs> and so, so you would expect that people learn by doing mistakes. And so it, the exploration of I did a mistake, so I probably shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. I will hear again, so I probably shouldn't be doing that. So also about the audience. Yeah. Um. Well, most triple A publishers, I hope, um, pull. 
thousands, if not millions, into um, market research and finding out about their core demographic. Obviously, if the core demographic is big enough, and that is what the game, that is who the game is uh, marketed for, that's the audience they're going to go after, and should tailor their tutorial to that demographic. Um, the smaller indie developers, it it's a tricky balance to find. Um, but you should probably be doing market research on your demographic anyway. And if, say, your game is best suited to, I don't know, say three-year-old children, you're obviously going to need something bright, enticing, and really simple, for that at least. Whereas if, say, um, you're designing a game for war veterans um, who have... Um, I've been, been flying planes for years, as a very weird example. Um, you, you're going to gear the, that tutorial to so, sort of the basic information that type of player would have. Um, but there's nothing wrong with um, putting external information, perhaps in the form of an optional tutorial, for players who aren't of that core demographic who might still end up playing your game. Hello. There we go. I'm going to deafen everybody. Um, you didn't touch, as far as I recall, on uh, tutorials or instruction in multiplayer scenarios. Um, one of the things that I found, uh, I'm trying to do a, a, like an arena brawler, and the, when I've sat people down, parts that are immediately obvious, left stick steer, which button fire? Try all the buttons, you know? Yeah. Um, but most people don't spot a oh, right stick aim. They don't think of that immediately, despite the fact that they perhaps come to it, uh, you know, from a first-person shooter. They think that's automatic. Um, it, do you have any good ideas on how a good way to approach that might be, um, you know? Uh, with regards to multiplayer games. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Thank you. Um, off the top of my head, I'm going to be completely honest and say um, no ideas whatsoever, simply because <laughs> <laughs> because as a player, I I do not like multiplayer games. Um, and that's a massive oversight of my um, professional um, side, I will admit to. Um, and simply when, it, when I was doing my um, dissertation on this, I didn't have the time or the resources to go too far into that. Um, but it's a discussion I'm certainly willing to have um, and brainstorm some ideas um, if need be at any point. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so the aesthetics of a lot of games um, rely on the real world properties of the objects inside of it to convey what you can do with them yeah. inside the game engine. But that's not the case for abstract um, games, uh, so puzzle games. Um, Soren Johnson uh, recently released um, Offworld Trading Corp. Uh, and it's come under uh, quite a lot of heat for the lack of tutorials or the, uh, the light touch with the tutorials um, for quite an abstract game. I mean, uh, fundamentally, it's a stock market where you're trading shares in each other's companies uh, to try and win a strategy game. So it's not the common experience of a lot of people to be doing this in their real life. But what's your advice for people who have um, abstract games and need to teach the mechanics without conveying the real world properties of the objects in the game? Um, hmm, okay. Um, abstract. Um, I'm just going to go off the bat and an abstract game I've recently played is um, The Unfinished Swan um, and there isn't really a tutorial in that um, what I mean is you have um, a quick prompt at the beginning of the game just showing the controls but it doesn't tell you anything about the game and that is a perfect example of um, the exploration type of tutorial so I'd say for abstract games, um, basically learning by mistakes, at least, that, that aren't detrimental to the progress of the game. Like you don't want to punish your players for trying out new things, um, but at the same time you want to reward them for trying out new things. Um, 
I'd say definitely get another whole exploration rate, perhaps even um, some sort of companion task in that they see that task being done by another character, for example, and sort of follow on from that. Um, so, so show me technique. Show, show me. Yeah, with, um, without it being that blunt, if that makes much sense. Because you could then very easily go down the route of insulting the player by um, them thinking that you as a developer think they're an idiot for doing that. And this is, with most of these things, it is a very tricky um, line to cross and basically as much playtesting as possible will refine everything down to hopefully perfectness, which is an impossible thing to strive for, I'm highly aware. Anyone else like to ask a question? I'll come back up. Uh, yeah, um, so you gave these seven examples of the different uh, tutorial types, and the last one you came up to was the natural progression type. Yeah. Now, since that one seems the most logical to use in most scenarios, are there any scenarios you can think of where that isn't appropriate? Or genres, or anything? Obviously, there are certain games where you want instant tutorial, you want them to play to know everything in, in quick circumstances, but that part, it seems like that is the best one to use in almost all the examples. Um, I, yeah, start mixed with narrative, um, simply because personal I prefer narrative games. Sorry, <laughs> I should probably stop putting my personal preferences in with this. Um, but yeah, I think natural progression is probably the best way to go, and I think most mobile games could also, should probably incorporate that as a most um, first time user experiences. I hate that term. Um, should the player everything they need to know right at the beginning and then three hours into the game or you come back after not playing for three months and you're just like, what, what does this button do? And next thing you know you've lost all of your money or something. So yeah, um, natural progression is definitely the way forward. Hiya. Oh, yeah. um, so I was wondering about mixing tutorial types as well, because I just made a casual game and I talked to the audience, which is uh, mostly women aged 30 to 80, you know, literally a big range. Yeah. And I had an optional tutorial uh, so that they could either follow the instructions or click it away if they thought they knew what they were doing, yeah. so it didn't insult them. Uh, backed up with an in-game manual, because they told me that they wanted to come back to the game if they had a break and maybe yeah look it up in, in the manual. And that, that seemed to work for them. I thought that was maybe a good approach and I just wondered if you had any ideas about combining different types. Um, also, um, on, I can't remember which slide it was, um, where um, ideally you should try to incorporate as many different types of learning techniques. Right. And if that requires um, doing different types of tutorials and allowing the user to choose, that's fantastic. And Aside from um, natural progression, that would be the best way forward. Um, because it does give your players a sense of control, which is respectful to the player, and it just really enhances the um, user experience. It would definitely be interesting to um, combine different types of tutorials and with, a different, with different genres of games and throw thousands of playtesters at it. I really wish somebody would give me lots of money in which to do that. Um, it, that would be highly interesting, I think. And I'm glad it worked for you. Uh, anyone else at all? We've still got time. If you've got a question you'd like to ask. No? I, oh, oh, we've got one. There's always one. <laughs> and of course it's Alistair. Hello. Hello. Um, so yeah, um, you talked early on about how you know, the earliest forms of tutorials were um, like printed instructions on the arcade hardware um, and you know you know the work that I'm doing is increasingly with installations yeah. and things yep. <laughs> so that idea is very interesting to me um, I was wondering if you had any um, sort of tips and advice or examples for what makes a good sort of 
printed tutorial on hardware? Um, just clear, concise information. Um, obviously, you don't want there to be too much text, um, especially if, say, then that game ends up being installed somewhere in say, um, Japan, for example. Your localization costs would go through the roof. Um, but then at the same time, you don't have to use text. You could just use images, for example, which would um, be highly beneficial for your game, at least, anyway. Or just simply a combination of the two um, with um, some really bright, vibrant, eye-catching images of some like in-game screenshots, but with also clear, concise, and very easy to read uh, simple instructions really like um, with that I'd recommend taking a look at um, a look at how IKEA do their manuals for example um, in that some people find IKEA um, manuals really easy to follow some people want to set the world on fire um, so that I'd say look at how um, things outside of games um, portray information and unfortunately I'm always going to say this play test just play test just let the players just observe the players in their natural habitat which is your game in, in any case thanks very much no problem anyone else or is, is it all good cool thank you very much